We're going a little out of order this morning, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit and then read our second scripture passage. So let's pray first. God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have always loved the creation story. It's always been one of my favorite pieces of scripture. I love the rhythm of it on the first day God created. I love the first sentence in the beginning when the earth was formless and void. I love the imagery and the repetition, rep, repetition within it. I love the theology that God loves God's creation. I also remember, though, the first time that it occurred to me that there might be some problems with this creation story. I was in a Sunday school class in fifth grade, and my teacher, Miss Katie Grover, who uh, after many years as a missionary is now a United Methodist pastor actually in Dundalk, talked to us about her own struggle as a science lover in reconciling the theory of evolution with the theology of the creation story. I remember her talking about dinosaurs and how we were to have faith but also believe in science, and she gave us permission to use our brains. Really, she encouraged us to use our brains. She would say things uh, like, God gave you a brain, so use it, when we were doing things we shouldn't be doing. So it was a lot of strong encouragement, I would say. Now maybe some of you have had the same struggle that Katie have. As people who believe in rational thought, who are educated and well-read, we have to figure out what we do with stories like the creation story or Noah's Ark, how we reconcile the stories of our faith with what we know from science. We've been uh, in the middle of a sermon series called Reading the Bible for All It's Worth, and we've talked about uh, how the Old Testament and the New Testament were written and what kind of genres of literature we find within them. We talked about how we read it. Do we read it uh, literally word for word? Do we read it as the inspire word of God? What does it mean that it was written by God? That's what we've been talking about over the last four weeks. And so the last two weeks, we've been talking about specific uh, scriptures within the Bible and how we read them as the people of God. Last week, we talked about how to reconcile those passages of violence that we find within scripture with what we know about God, that he is loving and just. Now, you might remember from science class that most scientists believe the Earth was formed 4.57 billion years ago. Water came to the planet over the next billion years, and then life forms, simple celled creatures, began to develop. About 500 million years ago, an explosion of multi-cell life forms began. 230 million years ago, the dinosaurs roamed the Earth. By the way, my youngest niece wants to be a dinosaur finder when she grows up, which I think is adorable. And then about 65 million years ago, some kind of major event caused a mass extinction that allows people to now be dinosaur finders. About 2 million years ago, pre-human hominids evolved, and over the next 1.9 million years, they evolved, changing through gene mutations and natural selections until we began. So how do we connect that story of science and creation with the biblical account that says creation began and was formed in seven days? Well, there are some who would take to a literal understanding of the story. They will tell you that the days within the scripture are really epochs or time periods that that in the first epoch, the earth was created, the atmosphere on the second, on the third day, dry land and plant life, on the fourth, the sun and the moon. On the fifth day, the fish and the birds, and on the sixth, the animals, finally culminating with human beings being created. But this view of the creation story as a literal representation of how the world was created, I think it sets up a false dichotomy telling us that we have to choose between science and God. And I don't think that's true. I think like Miss Katie told me when I was in fifth grade, that God gave us our brains and expects us to use them. We are not to check our intellect when we come into the doors of the church. And more than that, I don't think that's why these stories were written in the first place. They weren't meant to be science textbooks for us. They were not not meant as uh, history books in some places. They are meant to teach us about God and the way that God works in the world. 
If you remember last week when we talked about those stories of violence and the passages where it seems like God is condoning and even commanding genocide in some places, we talked about how those stories really tell us more about the people who wrote them and the time in which they were living than they do about God in some cases. They tell us what those people thought about the way God worked in the world. And this is a little different, I think, in that in those stories, the details are not as important. In this story, the details aren't as important. What's important is what it says about God and about our world and about what God thinks of our world. When I teach the creation story, I love to share one very important fact because it helped me to discover what these stories were meant for. But before I do that, I'm going to give us a quiz. I want you to tell me what you remember about the creation details. How was the world created? Tell me the creation story. You can just shout it out and we'll repeat back. Anything you know about the creation story? Hmm? Go ahead. You won't get a, you won't get a bad grade. I'm not passing out stars for anybody. God created the heavens and the earth, okay? And he saw that it was good. God separated day from the night. Good. Our Sunday school teachers have been doing good. Any, what do you remember? What? God says. God says. Very important. What do you remember about the way humans were created? From the dust of the earth. Okay. God created Eve from the rib of Adam. Okay. Excellent. Any other details? They were to take care of each other, is that what you said? We were to take care of the earth, good. Created in the image of God, good. Any others that are really important? So here's what you may, some of you may be hearing for the first time. There are actually two creation stories in scripture. And when I first learned that, I was probably 25 in seminary. I've been going to church my whole life, and nobody ever pointed out to me the fact that there were two creation stories. The first creation story is the one we find in Genesis uh, chapter 1 through about verse 3 in chapter 2. And then we find the second one in the second part of chapter 2, which is what we're going to read in a minute. They are completely different. Both teach us very important things about God and about God's creation, and really that is their purpose. The first creation story that starts at the very beginning of Genesis is beautiful. That's the one with the rhythm and pattern and repetition that I spoke about earlier. Each day begins with, and God said, and ends with, and it was so. God saw that it was good, and there was morning, and there was evening the first day. Now, this uh, creation story isn't meant to be a science lesson in cosmology. It is a beautiful and poetic and majestic poem. It's more like a creed or a hymn of praise. It's not making claims of scientific knowledge about God and God's creation. What it's saying is that God is good, that God is powerful, that he speaks creation into being, that the spoken word is meaningful and powerful, that creation is good, that we, both men and women, were created created in God's image. I like to think of it as a hymn of praise to God. Now the second creation story happens at the, at the middle part of chapter 2 and goes through chapter 3 and it offers up a little bit of a different lesson and that's the one that we're going to uh, read now this morning. So can we go to Genesis 2? I'm going to read Genesis 2 verses 4 through 9 and 18 through 23. These are the generations of the heavens and earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. 
The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we know that this creation story found in Genesis 2 was written by a different author from the first Genesis creation story in chapter 1. And we know that because the language that it uses is different. The Hebrew is very different. It even uses a different word for God, not Elohim, which we find in the first creation story, but rather here they use Yahweh or Jehovah, a personal name for the God that the Israelites worshipped. In this story, Yahweh forms the first two humans out of the dust of the ground. He does it with his hands, not with the spoken word. He places them in the garden, which he makes after he makes man, and he blesses them. Here is where we see Eve being made from Adam's rib, where in the first creation story, man and woman are made at the same time. Even the order is different. In the first story, man and women are created at the same time. Here, the man first and then the woman. In the first creation story, humans come at the end as the culmination of God's work. And here they are the first. The, animal are given, the animals are given to the man afterwards as a gift trying to find him a companion. In Genesis chapter 1, God is powerful, but here in Genesis 2, God is intimate and personal. He forms creation with his hands, not his voice, and he walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the afternoon, which I always think is a good reason why running is bad, because God walked in the cool of the garden. Just my personal theology there. This is not a story, this is the story not of a God far away in the universe, but of a God who is up close and personal, an intimate account, shared generation to generation around the campfire as a way of understanding the Israelites' unique relationship with God. The story continues into an explanation of why our world is no longer that perfect Eden that God created. God gives them a rule. Eat anything in the garden except the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which also, by the way, never says it was an apple. That's an art thing that happened in, during the Renaissance period. It, does, it is not an apple. I think it was a tomato, which is why we don't know if a tomato is a fruit or a vegetable. <laughs> also, just my personal theology. I cannot back that up in any way. So God gives them this rule, right? The one thing they aren't supposed to do. And what do they do? They do it. They break it, right? Because that's what they do. They choose to do as so many of us have done, to make the choice to do or take exactly what we're told we can't do or have. How many of us have made a choice just like that? Sometimes we're swayed by one another. It always, though, begins with a thought that isn't quite right that leads into an action that definitely isn't. So Adam and Eve are banished from paradise. This story sets up a pattern that the whole rest of humanity will repeat for years upon years. But it also helps us to understand our own stories, to understand why we are drawn to the very things that harm us. So if the first creation story in Genesis 1 is a hymn of praise or a creed, this one is more like a parable, not really a biography of the first two people in the world. Rather, it's what we call an archetypal story. An archetype is the original pattern that all others follow, and Adam and Eve uh, represent that for us. They are representatives of all of us, of humanity. This isn't just their story, it's our story. Even their names tell us that. Adam and Eve aren't so much names for them, like we've turned into them, them into with capital letters, but rather, in Hebrew, Adam simply means man or human. Eve means the bearer of life. Both names are symbolic, as are other pieces of the story. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is an archetype. The name points us to a deeper truth rather than just a poisonous fruit on a tree. The fruit of the tree represents doing those things that we know are wrong, that which seems so alluring in the beginning, but ultimately brings us separation from God and one another and ourselves. The serpent represents the voices that we hear in our heads that help us to justify our wrong choices, because we're really good at that, aren't we? 
Even Adam and Eve's response is typical of our own response when confronted with wrong. We justify and argue and deny and blame it on the next guy. So, what do we do with this? Well, I believe in evolution. I believe that our world changes every day, very slowly, bit over bit by bit over time. But I also believe that God's hand is a part of that process. Reverend Adam Hamilton, whose book we're using as a source called uh, uh, Making Sense of the Bible, quotes a member of his congregation in what I think is the best metaphor I've ever heard for how we reconcile science and the creation story. This, uh, just a member of his congregation, a layperson named Jimmy, said it this way, any craftsman can build a chair, but how many can design a chair that builds itself and improves over time? Evolution doesn't diminish God's glory, as some believe. To me, it magnifies God's glory. And here's the thing for me. If the writers of the Bible can't agree and really don't worry about agreeing, I mean, they're not sitting there having a fight over which creation story is true, it tells me that this is not the point of these stories. These stories are meant to affect us in our souls, not necessarily in our heads. It's not something to memorize, but something to let seep in to the way that you live. I don't live differently because of evolution, but I live differently because I believe that I am created in God's image, that there is a piece of God inside of me and a piece of God inside of you. I live differently because I believe that God is powerful and that the spoken word is important and we should be careful how we use it. I live differently because I believe that God brings order to the chaos of our lives, that life is a gift, that the creation around us is a gift. I live differently because I believe that God wants an intimate relationship with God's creation, that God's very hand is upon my life and upon yours. Our a first lesson that uh, Alexa read from Romans, I think, speaks this truth for us. It says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Their story is supposed to give us hope that it's not the end of the story, that we're no different from Adam and Eve and no different from one another when we make our wrong choices. It gives us hope that the God who created us will also reduce redeem, and sustain us. These creation stories were written to give us encouragement and hope, to remind us of the beauty of God's creation and God's hand upon it, to remind us of the image of God that exists within us, and that even when our choices take us away from that, that we can come back home. I go back to what Miss Katie first taught me. She'd be horrified if I still called her Miss Katie. We can argue about science versus faith, or we can simply know the deeper truths within the story. We belong to God. Thanks be to God. Amen.